As the fall sports season winds down, the winter season is just getting started. Welcome to another episode of the Left Bench TV. I'm Zach Solom. And I'm Danielle Stein. Basketball is back in College Park, and there are some new leaders on the men's team. With the departure of Melo Trimble, a trio of sophomores, Anthony Cowan, Kevin Herter, and Justin Jackson, are expected to step up. I think they're much more prepared. They're much more prepared in practice. They're much more prepared in, in the summer, um, how they handle things. Me, Anthony, Justin coming back. Jared and Checo becoming seniors. Uh, you know, he thinks there's guys on the team that are capable of being good leaders, and he definitely wants us to try to step up and be more vocal. The men's team returned to the Xfinity Center on Thursday for an exhibition game against Randolph-Macon College. Terps excited to get their season started. Quick look at the sophomores. Cowan finds Herter for an early tray. Then freshman Darryl Morcell hits a nifty layup in his debut, but he was not done yet. Check out this 360 degree slam. Terps take down Randolph-Macon 88 to 44. Darryl's a big time athlete, and you know one of the things he wanted to be able to do is play on a team where he can get to the rim. And I think we space the floor pretty well, and we have shooters around him, so it allows him to do it. I'm surrounded by shooters, so I know defenders can't really help off of them, so they give me a lot of opportunities to get in lanes and gaps and make plays. Brenda Friese's squad is back in action as well, and some big changes during the offseason. Stars Brianna Jones and Shatori Walker-Kimbrough graduated and are in the WNBA. Freshman phenom Destiny Slocum has transferred to Oregon State. Terps fell to Oregon in the Sweet 16 last year, this year, with just 10 players on the roster, they'll look to bounce back. I think it really has made us um, focus on, it's the little things that we do, and some days you might not feel like doing them, but it really is important to, to lock in and, and force yourself through that wall um, to prevent something like last season happening again. The women's team rolled through their first two exhibition games, beating Glenville State and Bowie State by at least 50 points each. And so far, many of the younger players are beginning to make a name for themselves. Against Bowie State, sophomore guard Blair Watson had a double-double with 30 points and 11 rebounds. Playing alongside guard Sarah Myers and forward Brianna Frazier, the Terps dominated the Bulldogs. I am now joined in the studio by Alex Flum and Brendan Hartlove here to talk some basketball. Guys, both teams wrapped up preseason play this week with dominant victories. Alex, starting with you, what can we expect from the men's team this year? Well, Zach, this is a new-look Maryland basketball team this year. Melo Trimble's off to the NBA, so they got to find new guys that are going to come in and step up. A lot of that is going to be leaning on three sophomores, Anthony Cowan, Justin Jackson, Kevin Herter, and you know other guys like Michael Tchaikovsky, Dion Wiley, they're going to have to step up as well. And Brendan, the women finished at 32-3 and last year and made it to the Sweet 16 of the tournament. What are some realistic expectations for the team this year? Well, Zach, it's kind of unsure right now. This women's team has lost six players from last year, including their top three scorers. But we'll get a good look at the team with early matchups against the likes of South Carolina and UConn here in November. But a lot of this team's success may depend on Elena Kristanaki, the transfer from Florida, and what she can provide this team offensively. Uh, you'll also see a lot of players returning, like Bree Frazier and Kyla Charles, that will step up to try to avenge that Sweet 16 loss. And for the women's sophomore, Blair Watson had a dominant performance in the exhibition last week. What can we expect from her this year? Well, she put up 30 points in that game. I don't think we'll see many 30-point performances from her, but she'll be a top player coming off the bench for Maryland. Uh, she's a lights-out three-point shooter, and she's shown that she can score many other ways as well. Last year against Wisconsin, a career-high 10 points coming off the bench. Um, but she's also very strong on the boards as well. She had seven away at Ohio State. So she's really shown that she can come off the bench, get meaningful minutes, and make a big impact against those top teams. And Alex, a lot of newcomers joining the men's team this year. What can we see from them? Well, the biggest two to look out for are the two freshmen, obviously. Daryl Morcell, who we've seen some highlights of, and Bruno Fernando both coming in. The two of them actually met on their official visit to Maryland. Bruno committed first, then Daryl committed afterwards, but Two of them should be very exciting players to watch this season. Also, Sean Obi coming in, a transfer from Duke, spent two years there, or spent one year at Rice as well. So he'll bring some experience and some power in the front court. And Alex, you have a story for us about a freshman on the women's team? Yeah, um, actually, there's one freshman on the women's team that knows a senior on the women's team. All right, let's take a look. Shanice Lewis is the only freshman on this year's Maryland women's basketball team. For Lewis, it's a new team. But there's a familiar face in College Park, senior guard Aisha Small. We were pretty much sisters back then. Lewis and Small knew each other in their hometown of Miami. 
I talk to her on the phone to make sure that before I make a decision, it's the right decision. And now they're back together. It's great to have somebody here from my hometown and we kind of like the same things and know certain stuff that probably people in Maryland probably don't know. And we get to talk about the weather like it's too cold here when it's only 60 degrees. With Small serving as a mentor. There's days when Shanice come in like, hey, Ish, I need you to do this. And Lewis taking her experienced friend's message to heart. I just have to be ready to play. Uh, whenever my name is called, uh, just be, be ready to play and put in the work in. For the Left Bench TV, I'm Alex Flum. The women's team will tip off their season this Friday against the University of Albany at the Xfinity Center here in College Park. Be sure to check out the left bench for the coverage. The wrestling and football teams took part in a doubleheader at Rutgers on Saturday. Originally, it was supposed to take place at Yankee Stadium in New York City, but unfortunately for both squads, the Battle of the Bronx became the Battle of Piscataway. When the move was announced last month, Rutgers stated that it was because of the Yankees' postseason run. Well, Rutgers reportedly also received a $750,000 refund. For fans of both teams, the move was a bit disappointing. But for wrestling, they still got to make their season debut in an interesting way. TLB TV's Jack Schemmel was there for the action. Wrestling outside? You don't see that every day. But today, here at High Point Solution Stadium at Rutgers, that's exactly what we saw. Welcome back to TLB TV. I'm Jack Schemmel. Maryland fell on the mat to Rutgers, 27-9. Head coach Kerry McCoy outside looking on, Rutgers got out to an early lead and didn't look back. But at the 141 weight class, Ryan Deal, who made the NCAA tournament last year, picked up a win at 10-9. It felt good to be back out there all together, I think. Moving forward, there's good experience out here. A special moment later for Josh Ugalde at 174, his house just 10 minutes from Rutgers. He earns a decision victory over 13th-ranked Jordan Pagano. Terps fall, but a special day for Ugalde and the rest of the team. I wrestle all over the country, Maryland, about three and a half hours away. It's, it's nice to have all of them over here being able to watch me. Just being able to get our guys out there. We came out, no one got hurt. That's always a plus. And, uh, you know, we got some good experience against the top team. So we're ready to build on and be ready to do some things next week. Tough loss to start the season for Maryland, but definitely a cool experience. For the Left Bench TV, I'm Jack Schemmel. For football, this weekend, the Terps were hoping to move one step closer to bowl eligibility. DJ Durkin's team looking for a Big Ten victory at Rutgers. They got on the board first, Max Bortenschlager finding Ty Johnson to put the Terps up 7-0. But the Scarlet Knights reply, Giovanni Rochino scampers into the end zone from nine yards out, tie game. 10-7 in the second, Mad Max looking downfield, his pass intercepted by Kai Hester as he takes this one to the house for a pick six. Third pick six of the year for Bortenschlager. Second half, Maryland looking to get the run game going. Jake Funk finds a hole and finds his way 53 yards downfield. That sets this up. Ty Johnson scores his second touchdown of the day. Terps on top 21-17 late. Game tied in the fourth. Bortenschlager taken down. He missed the rest of the game after this hit. Very next drive, Rochino completes the pass to Gus Edwards for a 23-yard touchdown, giving them the one-score lead. Fifth stringer Brian Brand in the game. One last chance on fourth down. DJ Moore can't make the catch. Terps lose 31-24. Loss puts them under 500 and at 4-5 and five on the season. Oh, this series is crazy. It's been crazy since I've been here, you know, because every game has been a it's been a good game or we'll come back, you know, something like that. So it's been a, it's, it's been fun, you know. I just just wish we could have came out on the on the winning side today. Looking ahead, just three games left for Maryland. All three opponents are ranked as of now: Michigan, Michigan State, and then Penn State. Terps need two wins to be bowl eligible. Will be tough for them. A bit more than three weeks ago, Maryland's men's soccer team was undefeated and rolling. Today, they've lost their last five matchups all on their home field. Men's soccer headed into the Big Ten tournament on Sunday as the fifth seed, going up against Wisconsin, which was the last team they beat. This time, the results panned out differently, falling to the Badgers 2-1. Terps will need to regroup with the NCAA tournament ahead. The field hockey team was also knocked out of the Big Ten tournament this week after a hard-fought battle against Penn State. The Terps will head into the NCAA tournament unseated, facing Wake Forest on Saturday. As the Terps stay alive in the NCAA tournament, TLB-TV's Josh Coggins explains 
how one player on the field hockey team is making an impact on and off the field. Sabrina Rhodes plays forward for a top 10 ranked Maryland field hockey team. She's played in every game this season and has helped the Terps get into postseason position. She has great speed, great skill, awesome, great reach. On the field, Sabrina has relied on incredible athleticism. Her dad played college basketball, while her mom played college basketball, softball, and field hockey. Her sister also plays field hockey at the University of Delaware. We're all very athletic and very competitive, so we don't really ever like, you know, quitting or giving up. But that's not all. My cousin's uh, from Puerto Rico, um, Javi, he played baseball. Javi is former Major League All-Star catcher Javi Lopez. It was pretty cool. Um, we would go to all his games and obviously got tickets to all the games, but it's just really awesome being related to someone who's just so athletic and it makes you want to be like better and do better in what you do. Unfortunately for Sabrina, some of her family was affected by Hurricane Maria. My um, grandparents and my uncle and four cousins were there uh, during the hurricane. We were really nervous at first because we couldn't contact them for like three to four days because all of the power went out. Her uncle's home in Ponce was damaged by the storm. Meanwhile, she has received a tremendous amount of support from her teammates. I know for Sabrina, it's about staying present, staying positive, and giving her all the support and love that she needs right now. Linnea Gonzalez, Sabrina's teammate and childhood friend, is also Puerto Rican. We're going to be asking our team if they can donate some uh, food and water and something that we can ship over there. For the left bench, Josh Coggins. Rhodes has started five games this season, scoring twice and adding two assists. The volleyball team is in the middle of a tough road stretch. They lost to two top 10 teams at Minnesota and Wisconsin this past weekend. On the bright side, they did take one set from the Badgers, but it doesn't get any easier. They'll be at sixth ranked Nebraska on Wednesday, and on Saturday, they'll be in Happy Valley to take on Penn State, the top team in the country. Now on to our top five plays of the week. At number five, we have Maryland's only goal of the Big Ten tournament. Junior Sebastian Elney fires this one to the back of the net, giving the Terps an early edge. The volleyball team providing number four. Great weekend for freshman Jada Gardner a few weeks ago. Eight kills and a win over Indiana. Then eight more kills the next day in an upset of then number 17, Purdue. Moving to the gridiron for number three, Jake Funk with the longest play of the game. For Maryland at Rutgers, he burst up the field for a 53-yard rush, which set up a touchdown by Ty Johnson. On to winter sports for number two, Blair Watson fires a full-court dime to Sarah Myers, who is there for the uncontested lay-in. And where else would we go other than Daryl Morcel for the number one spot? His breakaway 360-degree throwdown against Randolph Macon is our top play of the week. And with that top play, Daryl Morcel is our Terp of the Week. The freshman Morcel played in his first game at the Xfinity Center and stunned the crowd, putting up 14 points, including this. It may be November, but the Halloween spirit is still alive here in College Park. TLB TV's Brendan Hartlove has the spooky scoop. It's Halloween in College Park and the spooky spirit is taking over. But it's not just the women's basketball team that's getting in on the fun. Senior Josh Woods of the football team did his best impersonation of head coach DJ Durkin. It was funny because uh, he pulled, I was in the student union at getting Panda Express and he came up behind me and he was like, I act like Coach Durkin and like doing his little head nod and I just started laughing. I have seen Josh Woods' costume. He, he made a point to swing by the office and uh, I, I, I give Josh, Josh props on that. He, I think he did a good job. Even Coach Durkin himself knows how he will be celebrating the holiday. The, the trick-or-treating, I'm... I will not be partaking in. Uh, I'll be here watching film. But the great part is, you know, on, on a Tuesday night when I get home, the whole house is asleep. So, I, I mean, I have free reign right there. I can, I can go into those Halloween bags and just comb through it and pick out the things I like most, and I'll, I'm sure I'll probably do that. The Maryland men's basketball team is also in the Halloween spirit. If I dress up, I would be probably uh, Salt Bay, you know, like the guy with the soul. Probably that one. Uh, Kevin has a... Like Scooby Doo costume, it was 15 sizes too small. Um, clearly, they don't make Scooby Doo costumes for six, seven people. Scooby Doo costume, 
don't know if I have a Scooby-Doo costume. Andrew's telling me about my Scooby-Doo costume. He may be hiding it for me, but I don't. I'm not sure about what costume he might be hinting at. But Halloween hasn't always been fun for all Terps. Oh, I, I used to go out and get candy, but I was so tall as a kid that people didn't really think I was of age, so I never really got candy sometimes. I stopped celebrating Halloween at a young age. But. It's become a tradition for students to dress up like Coach Mark Turgeon, but we asked the players what he would be. Coach Turgeon. Huh. Oh, I mean, I have no idea. I really don't know. The zookeeping. He should wear a zookeeping um, costume because he's the keeper of of all of us, all of the animals, I guess. It would be kind of cool to see him dress up as one of us, like see what he thinks, like dress up in an outfit that I would wear. You'd have to have a lot of designer, I ain't gonna lie to you. He, he, you have to have a lot of, a lot of Gucci or something, but I mean, he could do it, he could pull it off. For the Left Bench TV, I'm Brendan Hartlove. Well, I, for one, Danielle, would love to see Kevin Herter in that Scooby-Doo costume. I know, me too, and hopefully next Halloween we'll get to see him in that. Well. That's all we have this week for TLV TV. Make sure to keep up with all of our content on theleftbench.com and on Facebook and Twitter at The Left Bench as well. And stay tuned for our next show in two weeks. For Danielle Stein and all of our Left Bench TV crew in College Park, I'm Zach Solon. Thanks for watching.